Hi, everybody, and so great to have another session of the ACE ACTS meeting. I'm going to talk a little bit about how to deal with a clinically staged T2 N0 mid rectal cancer lesion. And these lesions are sometimes tough. I don't have any disclosures. So, in order to think about any rectal cancer, I like to think about this kind of paradigm. On one hand, we want to make sure that we have optimal cure rate, but we're also thinking about morbidity, function, and overall mortality. And so when you look at the results of rectal cancer, it's really important to kind of consider all of these different metrics and endpoints there um, on the left-hand side of the screen. What's their function like? You know, what, are they going to wind up with a permanent stoma? Are we talking about local recurrence? And then what is everything that is in our, um, uh, in our tool bag in order to address these lesions? So the question is, do we give them neoadjuvant radiation therapy or do we resect? You have to first ask yourself, what type of resection are we talking about? Is it local? Uh, excision? Is it a TAMIS? Is it a low anterior resection that's going to take you all the way down? And, and do you trust your staging? Remember a lot of this, and whether it's MRI or whether it's endorectal ultrasound, we have to think about the limitations of the staging system. And there's no question that patient comorbidities or patient body habitus comes into it. Are we talking about a male who's got a BMI of 40? Or are we talking about somebody who's elderly, who has bad COPD and exactly how we can deal with those particular patients, whether there's life expectancy? And then whether or not you want to divert and how opposed is the patient to having diversion alone. And finally, we got to think about, I think, more in the future in terms of watch and wait, as we know that, um, you know, with neoadjuvant chemo radiation therapy, and then essentially saying that we're going to get a complete clinical response. We're using this more now with more advanced lesions, but I think more and more in the future, we're going to see the paradigm shift to these early stage lesions that may go all the way away. And then we can follow those patients. So here's our algorithm right now. So locally advanced rectal cancer um, goes on down the line. We at the Cleveland Clinic use consolidation chemotherapy. We'll then restage these patients. And if they want to go into that watch and wait protocol, they'll enter an active surveillance protocol after the complete clinical response. So that is not the, the, um, the paradigm, though, that's used for these early stage lesions. Again, if we're talking about right here, the T2, N0, and maybe select TME, you know, select T3 lesions, essentially these are the patients that might need under the classical paradigm to just undergo surgery, including a low anterior resection alone in this particular case. So we talked a little bit about before, but again, how T stage leads to lymph node metastases. So for T2 lesions, we're in the wheelhouse of saying anywhere between 12 and 40%, if you believe that series that are out there, will have lymph node metastases. And that's important if you're talking about local excision, because that is not going to be addressed by just having local excision alone without any other signs of any therapy. What about ultrasound versus MRI? And there's some classic differences between the two, between T stage, as you can see there, as well as N stage from them. So we took a look at patients that had clinically node negative, but pathologically node positive rectal cancer patients who did not receive new adjuvant therapy. So this is what the idea of saying, I have a T2 N0 mid rectal tumor. I'm going to take them right to surgery. And what we found is that there are a certain percentage of those that had essentially uh, were misstaged or they, had, or they were microscopic disease that didn't show up on MRI. And you can see that we compared the 18 that had no adjuvant radiation therapy versus any adjuvant radiation therapy and compared them with a the control group that were node positive from the beginning. And you can see here that the, the clinically lymph node negative, pathologically node positive with TME alone, again, this would be the group, that classic paradigm, in this case with an MR T2 N0 lesion, had worse overall survival, disease-free survival, disease-free survival, local recurrence and distant recurrence with the two other groups. So we're talking about the utility of chemotherapy in these patients. What about those who got upstaged? So this is an NCDB. So that's our national database that takes a look at all cancer patients. In this case, had post-op pathological node positive, uh, either adjuvant chemo radiation therapy, which we don't typically do a lot of adjuvant radiation therapy, adjuvant chemotherapy or observation alone. And you can see that if you look at the adjuvant therapy Overall survival is better than if you observe those alone, but there was no difference between adjuvant chemo and chemo radiation therapy. And again, we don't classically give them radiation therapy in the postoperative setting. Obviously, you have to have a technically uh, good operation because those with positive margins, if you did add, add adjuvant chemo radiation therapy, had really no change in overall survival versus adjuvant chemo. They just tend to do worse. So as surgeons, we need to make sure that we do a good operation.
So the question then comes in, why radiate at all? Well, we talk about preoperative radiation therapy you can see on the positive sides, increase your resectability, uh, decrease the risk of small bowel that might sneak down afterwards versus over-treatment um, for those patients who uh, don't need it. And it goes all the way back to the Swedish rectal cancer trials that showed that there was indeed a benefit to having radiation therapy. In the preoperative setting, we know that radiation therapy improves local control and that neo-chemo radiation therapy is superior to that to post-operative chemo radiation therapy. Again, these are classic trials. We know this uh, overall for surgery alone and then surgery alone uh, in versus the preoperative chemotherapy. The Dutch TME trial, uh, again, showed no difference in the German one between having uh, no impact on overall survival. And again, these are classic type studies that we're all well aware of. And it really got, speaks to the heart of saying, what is the role and, and what is the effect ultimately of having adjuvant or in some cases, neoadjuvant chemoradiation therapy for those who have rectal cancer? I do think it's important to understand that our radiation therapy is associated with some toxicity. So there's no question that even if you do it in the preoperative setting, those patients are a significantly higher rate of having Lars syndrome. And that can be the functional. It goes back to the metrics that I was talking about in the beginning of the talk. What endpoints are we talking about? And it's also something that we don't speak a whole lot about, and that's sexual dysfunction, especially sexual dysfunction in women that we may not, you know, they correlate. Uh, in men, you can see they will have, uh, you know, ejaculatory issues or erection issues, but women also have high rates of urinary and sexual dysfunction, dyspruna, re reduced vaginal, um, um, uh, vaginal uh, atrophy, voiding difficulties, and even a lack of desire. Uh, the postoperative setting is really not something that we use a whole lot of. Again, you can say on the positive side, you now know what you're dealing with. So they do have lymph node positivity and they can have accurate staging. Uh, it can decrease the operative difficulty because you're not operating in a radiated field. But again, it is, it is something that can cause functional problems and problems with your anastomosis overall. And, and that's, that's something to be debated. Um, we know that chemoradiation therapy in the postoperative function can lead to worse function as everything is seen right here. And then again, you don't want to necessarily rate that anastomosis. You can have either problems associated with um, chronic stricturing, or you can even have non-healing wounds if they're diverted approximately and lead to these chronic sinuses, which you could see. So if you're looking overall at rectal cancer and the multidisciplinary approach for neoadjuvant, really function is something that we need to think about. There's no change in overall uh, more morbidity and mortality is no change, uh, definitely right there. So what about cure rate? Well, we have to talk about surgical quality. So when you're comparing any type of thing, you have to say to yourself, if the goal is to do a formal operation, and in this case, a low anterior resection, how good is the mesorectal envelope? We can see on one stage, a complete mesorectal versus an incomplete or a near complete, they have significantly different outcomes as we follow them along. We also know that this is a skill set that's learned. We can go all the way back to you know two decades and look at the Stockholm TME project and really look and say that we know that if we teach people how to do a better and more proper TME, local recurrence goes down, deaths can go down, and the need to have an abdominal perineal section can even go down. These all occur no matter what you're looking at across the board. So the Swedish and the Dutch trial, when you compare each of those, this goes to show that, again, you're really standardizing the TME between the two trials. So, you know, in the Swedish trial versus the Dutch trial, what we really added in this case, in many cases, is a better TME. So we can take our rate of local recurrence, not only down to 8%, but we can further reduce that with the addition of radiation therapy from 11 to 2%. The other thing that we don't talk a whole lot about is saying, let's leave radiation therapy out of this and let's talk about that circumferential resection margin. What is the role of that threatened margin? And as you can see in this study, there clearly is a cutoff for which that local recurrence rate, depending on how you're looking at it, substantially goes up. So if you're dealing with something under three millimeters, the rate of local recurrence, as you're not getting all the way around that and not getting that margin as high as it can be, goes up, if not double, but in some cases, three or four fold. Surgical quality, then again, plays a high rate on local recurrence. So in this particular paper, you can see that if you had a positive circumferential margin versus a negative resectional margin, there's a huge rate of having local recurrence, a big jump. It also makes a determination in terms of where the plane of surgery is. So take a look at your mesorectal, where you've got a nice plane of surgery versus if you're into it a little bit or you're all the way down to the muscle, 
you're gonna have a much higher rates of having tumor that's left behind, which will ultimately translate you into having a high local recurrence rate. So if we would follow this all out and really look at what the role of a circumferential resection margin is for modern cancer, we know that it not only affects in, on this side, on the left-hand graph, more local recurrence rates with the circumferential resection margin. That's, that's actually, that makes sense, right? You're potentially leaving two or behind and so you expect your lower recurrence to go up. But what is important is that you can even find that there's more distant metastases with a circumferential resection margin that's positive. And many people may not be able to think that way. But it is clear that as a surgeon, it's very important as to what we are doing with these patients. So if you look at the guidelines and follow them out, here's the NCCN guidelines. And so take a rectal cancer that's appropriate for section. And this is what we're talking about, that T2N0 lesion. And again, we see a transabdominal resection or low anterior resection. And then depending on what comes out, whether or not you need to have e-adjuvant chemotherapy, because if it does come out pathologically, that there was still lymph node negativity in these patients, we would just observe them. If it does turn out that they have lymph node positive patients, then you have to start to say to yourself, okay, you'd be in a T2N positive, and then the role would be to have adjuvant chemotherapy or adjuvant chemoradiation therapy. In terms of neoadjuvant therapy is what we use here. One of the things you see right now is that in general, this is a T3 or NEN lesion with a clear circumferential resection margin or T1 or T2 with N positive therapy. So it's really not this group of patients as yet that would say that we're going to give them neoadjuvant chemoradiation therapy in the get-go. There was that the Z64 trial that took a look at um, uh, for T2 lesions N0 that you could do a local excision uh, after you gave them chemoradiation therapy, but it really hasn't bought on in the long threshold. So we do use a lot of total neoadjuvant therapy, but again, talking about T3, no positive, or T4, no positive. So which approach is more positive? So the Z64 uh, one trial that we talked a little bit about before. So this was a phase two trial, some ways ago, but it talked about local excision uh, after new adjuvant chemoradiation therapy. Um, and again, this is about a decade old, but it was only 90 patients, 77 completed the planned trial. They were tend to be small lesions and lesions that we could access from below. You can see that we had a good results for those patients that had resection margins that were negative. The vast majority of the patients were downstage, including some cases to having no uh, residual tumor within the wall itself. Um, and upwards of half actually had a pathological complete response. But there was 5% of patients that had uh, actually T3 lesion. This goes to the importance of making sure that you have appropriate staging. And five still specimens out of, again, 77 that had lymph node positivity. As we follow these patients out, this was um, the 2015 data. You can see the estimated three-year disease for survival in this group was about 88%. And for the per protocol group was 87%. Of the 79 eligible patients, um, about a third of them had, you know, had severe or grade three gastrointestinal adverse events. Some people had pain, other people had hematological adverse events and those who had surgery, you know, pretty similar events across the board. So the question then comes up is saying, you know, is this the way to be able to go forward? So here was the, um, here's the trial of chemoradiation local excision versus total mesorectal excision for T2N0 lesions of rectal cancer. So again, we're talking about here what is it, the type of surgery that you're gonna undergo? We know that those patients that have a T2N0 without anything tend to have you know, a rate of lymph node positivity or they tend to have a higher rate of recurrence. And that goes all the way back to the Minnesota data from several de decades ago. And in this case, you can see that in many cases, they concluded that in patients who underwent chemoradiation therapy plus local incision, oncological outcomes were similar to those who underwent TME with fewer complications requiring your operation but a significantly higher rate of chemoradiation therapy toxicity, right? But well, that should make sense. So although the quality of life was decreased in that and improved in TME patients when considering anorectal function, results were actually both worse in both groups. So Eric Roulier uh, out of Bordeaux and in France uh, put together a large uh, trial. This is the GRECR2 um, um, phase three trial, uh, looked at 15 centers across France. This was T2, T3, very low lesions that had a good clinical response to neochemoradiation therapy. They either got local excision or they went on to have TME. Um, it is important to understand that 26 in the, in the local excision group did go undergo to have completion TME. And you can see their composite year endpoints right there. So 56% of, um, of local excision and 48% of TMEs had a primary event. And in this case, the primary event was 
one of the composite endpoints there. And, um, and they determined, again, that equivalence might be improved by better local excisions, patient selection, or fewer local excision failures requiring a later TME. So we go back to the importance of what it means uh, as surgeons to have a good TME specimen. Because if you look at the ACASOG Z6051 trial, again, uh, it's a non-inferior trial. Many patients uh, or many people have taken a look at this. These were experts in laparoscopic surgery. You can see the endpoints between the two in terms of laparoscopic versus open success rates with no significant difference between the two. Uh, Andrew Stevenson um, out of Australia uh, similarly did a non-inferiority randomized controlled trial and had very similar findings. In this case, 82% um, success versus 89%. Um, the follow-up uh, three-year for each of these showed, you know, the two-year disease free survival and lap versus open was not significantly different. There was disease free survival that was higher with unsuccessful resection, um, positive circumferential resection margin, positive distal margin. Same thing for the Stevenson's trial that took a look and showed that there was no significant difference between the two in terms of local recurrence, disease free survival, or overall survival. And so the take home message in this particular case is that if you're comparing your outcomes, and whether you're talking about robotic or laparoscopic or open, we've got to make sure that we perform a good TME, we've got a great uh, you know, we have a negative circumferential resection margin. We have a, um, you know, we want to make sure that our mesorectum is complete, if at all possible, uh, and that we don't have positive margins behind. So regardless of the technique, the outcomes must be carefully tracked and quality measures that have to be subject to internal audit. So my thoughts in this particular case is that rectal cancer of mid and low rectum shouldn't necessarily be performed at every institution or by every surgeon. Not every surgeon has the skill set to be able to do that. And as surgeons, we need to be able to be tracking how our outcomes are and view those outcomes in light of what it is, not necessarily some of these experts that are out there. And a rectal cancer specialist should be technically facile in multiple, multiple techniques. So the best technique for rectal cancer should be based on both patient and tumor variables. We should use a tailored approach to each patient. You can't just say, oh, T2 um, and zero. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to give them, you know, uh, along the lines of a watch and wait protocol, or I'm going to go straight to TME, or I'm going to go ahead and give local excision. You got to view it in terms of each of these different aspects for both patient-centered as well as institutional-centered or surgeon-centered approaches. And there are surgeons, there's no substitute for a proper operation. So thank you very much. Uh, enjoy the Congress and very excited to uh, spend time with each of you.